Welcome back everyone to our lecture series based upon the textbook Linear Algebra Done Openly. As usual, I am your professor, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Good to have you here today. Uh, this video lecture is going to focus on section 4.6 from the book entitled The Fundamental Theorem of Linear Algebra. As the name probably suggests, it's sort of a big deal. Um, we only like to give names to theorems when we actually want to remember them beyond just the page. 5.6.7, what have you. And then also the, the term fundamental is quite, it's not used that often in mathematics. And we have the fundamental theorem of calculus, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, uh, fundamental theorem of algebra. It, it, it's meant to sort of represent a big deal. So, and often on a very all encompassing, this is what the focus of this class was about. Now, I don't know if I necessarily say this theorem necessarily focuses on everything uh, in a typical first semester of linear algebra. Certainly there's two more chapters in the textbook, uh, but it does summarize and encapsulate a lot of what we've done up to this point. And so to be, before we start talking about the theorem itself, uh, let me remind you about the fundamental spaces of a matrix. And we've talked about some of these already in this lecture series. So for this discussion, let A be an M by M matrix. It does not have to be square. Uh, and it's the, it's the matrix representation of some transformation T, for example. And let's say that that transformation had, I should say the matrix had P pivots in it. Well, what is the null space of that matrix? Well, as a reminder, the null space represents the set of all solutions to the homogeneous system of equations. So X, we want all vectors X such that AX equals the zero vector. Uh, this is our null space. Null of A is just short for null space. And the null space should be viewed as a subspace of the vector space Fn. So man, as a reminder here, this, this transformation T, this is a map from Fn to Fm, where F is just some field in and M are positive integers. I can get zeros okay as well, so they're non-negative integers, I should say. And so the matrix that's representing this transformation would be an M by N matrix. It's null space is the set of all vectors, which multiply by the matrix on the right to give you zero. And this is a subspace of Fn. Uh, the dimension of the null space is what we mean by the nullity the nullity of a matrix. And this is gonna equal the number of non-pivot columns in the echelon form there. Uh, because for the null space, each free, or each, yeah, each free variable in the system of equations will correspond to a vector which helps generate the null space. And so we get each of the vectors in the basis by pulling them from the free variables present here. Uh, and this was, the, this was one of the first, I think this actually was the first uh, fundamental space we had talked about for matrices. The second one is the column space, which uh, is the second one listed here, the column space. The column space is a set of all vectors of the form AX, where X is just some generic vector from FN. As a subspace, this will be a subspace of Fm. Uh, because if you take a vector with n components and multiply it by a, that'll transform it into a vector of m components. Originally, we had to find the column space to be the span of all, the span of the column vectors of, of the matrix A. This, what we have written on the screen, is equivalent to that. Uh, the dimension of the column space this is what we call the rank of the matrix. And it's going to equal the number of pivot columns inside the matrix. So if P is the number of pivots, we get those. All right. And then the third one that we had introduced before was the so-called row space. Uh, officially speaking, the row space was defined to be the column space of A transpose which uh, of course can be defined as this A transpose, uh, we're gonna call this vector Y now, 
y is a vector in f m. But it can be a little bit more helpful to think of it in the following way. We're going to think of all of the row vectors y, so that uh, that is all the row vectors y transpose times a, where again y is a generic vector from fm. And so with this perspective, this is a subspace of the vector space Fn. Again, I kind of kind of prefer the second approach because we like to think of the row space as consisting of row vectors as opposed to the column space, which consists of column vectors. Now, the dimension of the row space of A, uh, this is going to be what we call the co-rank of A. And similar to the rank, it's equal to the number of pivots uh, because the dimension of the column space comes from the number of pivot columns in the echelon form. Uh, the dimension of the row space comes from the number of pivot rows. And these two things are actually equal to each other. Uh, this is not a coincidence. It's actually part of the fundamental theorem we'll talk about in a moment ago. Uh, the, the rank and the co-rank are always equal to each other. Now, I should caution you that when we talk about the transpose, we're referring to a real matrix. Um, if we were a complex matrix, we'd have to replace this with A star. And likewise, this would become Y star as well. Though the main difference here is that we would then have to be taking the conjugate uh, of all the complex numbers involved. And so there's a slight distinction. We're not really going to do much examples in this lecture uh, using complex numbers. <clears throat> but be aware that if one was working with the row space of a complex matrix, we do need to make sure we take conjugates of these vectors here. Now, the fourth and final fundamental space, which I'm now going to reveal to us now, um, is what we refer to as the left null space. The left null space. And this is the fourth fundamental space that gets ignored often. Uh, actually, in preparation of this lecture, I was looking through a lot of other linear algebra textbooks I had access to. And many, many don't even mention the left null space whatsoever. Now, it's defined analogous to how we define the row space. So the left null space is in fact going to be the null space of A transpose, the, the, the adjoint matrix to, to A here. Uh, again, for complex matrices, we're going to have to do a, a star, uh, but everything else which would, would change accordingly. Now, if you think of it as the null space of A transpose, what we're doing is we're looking for all vectors Y such that A transpose Y equals the zero vector. And this, of course, is naturally viewed as a subspace of Fm. Although the way we actually prefer to think of the left null space, and this is actually where it gets its name, is we're actually going to think of the set of all vectors y such that y transpose a equals zero. So we actually want to think of it as the set of all row vectors, which if you multiply A on the left, you get zero, where the regular null space is all the column vectors, which you multiply on the right uh, of A to get zero. And so that's hence the name left null space, your multiply on the left. And you want to think of the row space and the left null space as row vectors, not necessarily column vectors. I mean, it doesn't make much of a difference whether you write them as rows or columns, but we do, in terms of matrix multiplication, it will matter. And in terms of the products, uh, these should be row vectors for these two fundamental spaces here. And by analog, we call the dimension of the row space the co-nullity. This is the dimension of the left null space. And we will just denote this as L in L of A for left null space. And just like the null space, this thing will be computed as M minus P, where... M is the number of rows in the matrix and P is the number of pivots. So we're trying to count the number of non-pivot call of uh, non-pivot rows, excuse me, in the matrix. And this gives us the dimension of the left null space. Well, if you reduce this to echelon form, the non-pivot rows are going to correspond to rows of zeros. And uh, this actually helps us kind of better understand what the left null space is doing. Um, the left null space is essentially measuring how much the column vectors of A do not span uh, the vector space Fm, much in the same way that null space measures how much the column vectors are not linearly independent. Um, 
so kind of, kind of let me explain that a little bit more there. We've seen that for a matrix A, the columns of A are independent if and only if the null space is trivial. Uh, so we actually use that to help us kind of understand when a linear transformation is one-to-one. -one. Come down here for a moment. Uh, so we've seen that the transformation T is one-to-one -one if and only if uh, its kernel, the kernel of T, which is none other than just the null space of its standard matrix, it's the null space of its standard matrix representation. This is one to one exactly when this is the trivial vector space zero zero. And in fact, this will happen if and only if the columns of A are linearly independent. So this idea of linear independence of columns coincides with injectivity of a linear transformation, and they're connected by the triviality of the null space. Uh, so, and, and in, more gener in more generality, the dimension of the null space of the matrix A, it's nullity, right? Measures the size of the null space, but it also counts the number of free variables in, this, in the linear system AX equals B. I kind of mentioned that before. Um, this is, of course, the number of the non-pivved columns in minus P. Uh, so let, let's talk about the left null space for a moment then. Similarly, the columns of A span, they span FM if and only if the left null space is trivial. And so if we kind of write this down, uh, the transformation T is in fact onto if and only if the so-called co-kernel of T which the co-kernel is just really just, it's it's also the left null space. These are all the same thing. It's the left null space of the matrix. It's the co-kernel of the transformation. When this thing is trivial, then the transformation's onto, which happens exactly when the columns, columns of A span FM. So the null space measures the linear dependence of the columns of A. The left null space measures the spanning capacities of the columns of A. And so the dimension of the left null space of A, its so-called co-nullity, measures the size of the left null space, but also counts the number of rows of zeros in the row-reduced echelon form. Um, in this, and this, of course, is just M minus P, like we mentioned before, um, the presence of a row of zeros in the echelon form of A allows for the possibility of inconsistency in the system of equations, AX equals B. And it's dependent upon the choice B, right? Uh, if, you, if the echelon form of A has a row of zeros, then there might be some choices of B that makes AX equals B consistent, and there might be some other choices that make it inconsistent. Uh, another way I like to think of the left null space is that essentially the left null space is the subspace of FM, for those vectors B, which definitely make AX equals B inconsistent. So let me give you an example to try to explain what's going on there. So consider the following three by three matrix A. Uh, it's the matrix three, negative three, negative two, first row, second row, negative five, four, three, and third row, one, five, negative two. So I want you to consider the vector, the row vector seven, four, negative one. If we multiply these two matrices together, thinking of the row vector as a one by three matrix, uh, by the usual uh, dot product multiplication between these, these matrices here, uh, we're going to get for the first position, seven times three, which is 21, minus four times five, which is 20, minus one. That's the first entry, which if we just simplify that right now, that gives you a zero. Take the row vector times the second column, we get negative 21 plus 16, plus five, five and 16 is 21, minus 21 gives us another zero. And then lastly, seven times negative two is negative 14, four times three is 12, and negative one times negative two is plus two. Two and 12 is 14, minus 14 gives a zero. And so we see that the product of this vector, uh, we'll call this vector here y, the product of the, of the row vector y by the matrix gives us zero. And so therefore, 
uh, this would show that the vector y lives inside the left null space of the matrix A. That's what I mean to be in the left null space. Now, in terms of inconsistency, come to this, look at the system of equations you see in front of us with the augmented matrix. So this would be the system AX equals here Y. A is the same matrix as before. Um, if we try to row reduce this thing, let's go through the steps here. Um, I see there's a one here at the bottom. And so I'm going to actually interchange the rows, put that one on the top. So we get one, negative five, negative two, negative one. And we're gonna get for the next row, nothing happened, negative five, four, three, and four. And then the, uh, the last row was the first row, three, negative three, negative two, and seven. And so now we have our pivot in the one, one position. Uh, now to zero everything out below, I'm gonna take row two, and add to it five times row one. I'm also gonna take row three and subtract from it three times row one. So this will look something like plus five, minus 20, minus 10, and then minus five right there. And then for the third row, we're gonna take three minus three. We're gonna get plus 15. Uh, we're gonna get plus six, and then we're gonna get plus three. So we didn't do anything for the first row, so leave it alone. Negative five, one, negative five, negative two, negative one. For the second row, we get zero, negative 16, negative seven, and negative one. Uh, and then for the next one, we're gonna get zero, 12, four and 10, like so. All right, and so let's see what we can do now. Uh, so the next thing to do would be look at the next pivot right there. Uh, let's see, oh, I made a mistake there, I'm sorry. Uh, I felt, I, my spider sense was tingling, something was going wrong here. Uh, so for the second row, uh, we need to times everything by uh, we need to times everything by 5. So 5 times 5 is a 25. Uh, so we get right there. 2 times 5 was fine. 1 times 5 is there. Uh, so that changes. This isn't a negative 16. Uh, that would be negative 25 plus 4. So I guess it's negative 21. My bad right there. Um, what I want to do next is I'm going to scale the second row. Uh, I see the 21 and the 7, so I'm going to divide everything by a negative 7. And then for the for the third row, I want to do similar things, but I'm going to divide it by uh, 4. And if we do that, again, first row stays the same. Whoops. Uh, so for the second row... If we divide everything by negative seven, we're gonna get three, one, and one seventh. And then we get zero, three, one, and we divide everything by four, so we're gonna get five halves. You can kind of see the issue that's now approaching us here, right? If you were to just cancel out, if you take row, uh, let's do that in red here. If you take row three and subtract from it row two, uh, you're going to see that there's some inconsistency going on here. Just copying down the first and second rows. We're not doing anything to them this time. And so we get 0, 3, 1, and 1 seventh. But then when we subtract the third row, uh, the second row from the third row, we get 0, 0, 0. But then we get 2 fifths minus a seventh. Uh, sorry, five halves minus a seventh, which should give us like 13 fourteenths, I think. Uh, but whatever it is, it's not zero. And so this tells us that AX equals Y is in fact inconsistent. And so this is what I meant earlier by vectors in the left null space, space are definitely inconsistent. If you take anything in the left null space, AX equals Y will always, always, always be inconsistent.